Hanan, thank you very much indeed for reading. May I add my welcome to you. It's lovely to see you here. Let's pray, shall we? And then we will uh, consider the passage we've just read. Gracious Father, we do pray that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things out of your word. And that which the world mocks, we pray that you would cause us to wonder at. In Jesus' name, amen. Crucifixion was unspeakably painful and degrading. Whether tied or nailed to the cross, the victim endured countless spasms as he pulled with his arms and pushed with his legs to keep his chest cavity open for breathing and then collapsed in exhaustion until the demand for oxygen required renewed effort. The whipping, the loss of blood, the shock from the pain combined to produce agony that could go on for days, ending finally in death by suffocation, cardiac arrest or loss of blood. When there was reason to hasten death, the execution squad would smash the victim's legs and death followed almost immediately either from shock or from collapse that cut off breathing. Beyond the shame, the pain, there was the shame. The later rabbis wouldn't allow crucifixion as a form of capital punishment for that reason. In ancient sources, crucifixion was universally viewed with horror. In Roman law, it was reserved only for the worst criminals and lowest classes. No Roman citizen could be crucified without a direct edict from Caesar. And among the Jews, the horror was compounded because of the statement of the Old Testament law that reads, anyone hanged on a tree is under God's curse. So in Israelite law, this meant the corpse of a judicially executed criminal was hung up for public exposure that branded him as cursed by God. And the Jews' demand that Jesus be crucified was aimed at arousing maximum public revulsion. So writes Don Carson in his commentary on Matthew's Gospel. And over the next three weeks, we're going to be spending time, as it were, at the foot of the cross as we sit with Matthew and the early church being instructed, if you like, by the apostles and learn from Matthew, our tutor, what he has to teach us of the purpose and meaning of Jesus' death. And there can be no doubting the pain, the shame, and the public disdain as Jesus hung there. So if you glance through the reading and then on a few verses, you can see the language of mockery is everywhere. Look at verse 29. At the end of the verse, kneeling before him, they mocked him. Look at verse 31. When they had mocked him. And look at verse 41, so also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him. Added to the mocking is the derision of verse 39, those who passed by derided him. And the revulsion of verse 44, the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in this way. The word to mock is taken from a word that means to play like a child, and it speaks of jesting, of making sport of a person, of using somebody as your plaything for your own or other's amusement. But in the course of Matthew's account, though mockery is to the fore, I want to suggest that there are two aspects in particular which he wishes us to dwell on. You can see that the derision from verse 27 to verse 37, that's our reading today, is bracketed by the mock declaration of Jesus as king. The end of verse 29, kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. Verse 37, they put the charge against him over his head, which reads, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So that the particular mockery of verse 27 to 37 is bracketed by this statement of kingship. And then the specific mockery of verse 38 to 44, which we're going to look at next week, 
is bracketed by the robbers who are crucified, one on his left, one on his right. Verse 38, then two robbers were crucified with him. Verse 44, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. And though kingship is absolutely to the fore in next week's passage, the particular focus of the mockery next week is on salvation. He saved others. He cannot save himself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross and save yourself. And the particular focus this week, I think, is on the kingship of Christ. So we have then two themes as we come and sit at the foot of the cross and wonder at Jesus nailed there. The identity of the one on the cross and then his work. Kingship and salvation. And so what I want us to do this week is to consider the identity of the one on the cross. He is king of the Jews. And what I want us to do next week is to consider the accomplishment of the one on the cross. As king of the Jews, he brought salvation. And today, as we look particularly at verse 27 through 37, but we'll glance into the next week's passage, we're going to see that they mocked him as king at the cross, that they mocked Jesus as king in fulfillment of scripture at the cross, and that all creation will bow before the king whom they mocked at the cross. There are our three points. They mocked Jesus as king at the cross. They mocked him in the guardhouse, verse 27 to 30. In verse 27, Matthew tells us that the whole battalion at the governor's headquarters gathered. The battalion would have consisted of about 600 men. A posting to Jerusalem for a battalion in the Roman army must have been fraught with frustration and long periods of boredom. And so we can picture the 600 rough and ready soldiers from disparate conscript nations fed up with having been deployed away from the action to a backwater of the Roman Empire. Here's something to do, some light amusement. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered the whole battalion before him. The stripping in verse 28 on its own suggests humiliation. Jesus stands and has his clothes roughly and forcibly removed from him. He is now naked before his captors, impotent. They stripped him. And the scarlet robe, they put a scarlet robe on him in verse 28, was a deep, almost purple garment of Roman military or civil officialdom. And added to this, you can see in verse 29, twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. That is a faux crown from palm spikes or a canthus thorn, thick, woody, sharp, and barbed. And then in verse 29, the cloak and crown are complemented with a staff of some sort to imitate a ruler's scepter. And then we can picture them one by one, a daring individual breaking from the gathered throng of 600, a slightly more extrovert character, racing to the feet of Jesus, so dressed, falling on the ground before him, rising, grasping hold of the staff, almost certainly made of some sort of wood, and bringing it thudding down on his thorn-crowned head before spitting in his face and retreating from their brief moment of celebrity to the anonymity of the crowd. Added to the mockery in the guardhouse, which we see in 27 to 30, we then see mockery at his execution. Matthew is eager that we grasp the intensity of humiliation, and so he restates in verse 31, and when they had mocked him... They stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. By now, you can see from verse 32, Jesus is so exhausted that he cannot carry his own cross. And so Simon, a Gentile from Cyrene, is co-opted. And when they reach Golgotha, which means skull, the Latin for skull is calva, therefore hence Calvary, there they crucify him. 
But first, verse 34, they offer him wine to drink mixed with gall, and when he tasted it, he would not drink it. It could be that the gall of verse 34 is some sort of narcotic designed to dull the pain, in which case Jesus is determined to enter his execution fully conscious. It is more likely that this is simply another form of taunt. In Greek and, and in Hebrew, I'm told by the boffins that the word gall speaks of a bitter poisonous substance. What a joke! We'll give him this king of the Jews, something undrinkable to quench his thirst. Let's see what he makes of that. He tastes it and immediately spits it out. And then having mocked him at his execution, they mock him before the world publicly with this sign, verse 37, having divided his garments amongst them by casting lots, they sit, having sat down to keep watch over him there, they have this sign over his head, the charge against him, reading, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Pilate takes Jesus' claim on which the Jews had had him executed and taunts the Jews by means of it. One commentator writes, this is humanity at its worst. Bored, frustrated soldiers engage in acts so despicable as to be unrepeatable here in polite society on a Sunday morning. This is Abu Ghraib. This is North Howard Street Mill or Fort White Rock in the Turf Lodge before the days of prisoners' rights and litigation. This is humanity. This is what we're capable of. This is the nations before their rightful ruler. On its own, however, this does leave us asking the question, well, so what? After all, this is just what soldiers do. And those who crucified Jesus would have crucified many others. And when someone has made claims to be God the Son, the Son of God, and when someone has said, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, then it's entirely understandable that someone else might slip something into his drink as a bit of a joke, see what he makes of that. And we can quite see how Pilate, the Roman governor, on whose orders the execution is enacted, pins this provocative title over the head of Jesus, simply to rub the noses of his quarrelsome subjects and ungovernable nation in the dirt. So I guess on its own, this might lead us feeling sorry for Jesus. How sad. What a wonderful life. What a pity. What a tragedy, as somebody once said to me. What a tragedy. Somebody came on Christianity Explored. There one week, first week, objecting vociferously, there the second week, hearing of the death of Jesus. What a tragedy. But I, I'm convinced and I want us to look at something now which should convince us, I think, I hope it will, that it, it, it is far more than simply tragedy. And that's Matthew's aim in recording things so precisely. What we're going to do now is we enter into our second point, they mocked him as king in fulfillment of the scriptures, is to consider what it is that Matthew is actually doing here in his account. There's no doubt that through the rest of the gospel, Jesus is portrayed by Matthew as God's chosen king and ruler. That's how the gospel begins. That's how the gospel ends. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This is Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. All the way through the gospel, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. At his trial, from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power. So there's absolutely no doubt that Matthew is portraying Jesus as king throughout his whole account. Jesus Christ claimed to be ruler of the universe, your ruler and mine. And there's no doubt that Matthew also repeatedly deploys and cites the Old Testament scriptures to back up his case by way of evidence. And he does that particularly abundantly in the first three or four chapters of Matthew's gospel where he says this was to fulfill, this was to fulfill, so was fulfilled. 
And he does it particularly in the final chapters of Matthew's Gospel. Thus was fulfilled, as it is written, then was fulfilled. In fact, you know, if we were to do one of these kind of analytical charts, and you had your coloring pens, you know, geographers love this kind of thing, and you were to have chapter by chapter through Matthew's Gospel, and you were to shade your chart kind of deep red for major references to the Scriptures, you would find the opening four chapters and the closing four chapters just loaded. It would be heavily red. And towards the middle, it would be slightly more faint. But here's the thing. From chapter 27, verse 27, direct statements, this is to fulfill what was written, disappear altogether. Instead, what we have is an almost perfect blow-by-blow -blow fulfillment of one particular Old Testament psalm without any overt reference to it. And I think what Matthew is assuming is that by now, you know, we're thinking in the right kind of terms and we can spot, well, Psalm 2, Psalm 69, several other psalms, but in particular Psalm 22 being fulfilled in precise detail again and again and again through the crucifixion narrative. So that, can I put it like this? I hope this makes sense to you. Psalm 22 now becomes the grid through which we understand what's going on. Matthew is no longer having to say, by the way, you've got to turn back to this passage if you're really going to understand what's going on. And the fact that Jesus is, as it were, humanly impotent in the hands of his captors and unable, humanly speaking, to influence anything adds weight to the significance of what's going on because Psalm 22 is being fulfilled with precision. So, verse 27 of our reading, they gathered the whole battalion before him. Psalm 22, verse 16, dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. Verse 29, they mocked him. Psalm 22, verses 6 and 7, I am scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. Verse 34, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. Psalm 69, for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Verse 35, they crucified him. Psalm 22, verse 16 and 17, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. Verse 35, they divided his garments amongst them by casting lots. Psalm 22, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Verse 36, they sat down and kept watch over him. Psalm 22, verse 17, they stare and they gloat over me. And then next week, verse 42 and 43, a direct quote from Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, without a reference to Psalm 22. So whilst Matthew doesn't directly tell us that all this is a fulfillment of the theme in the Psalms of God's appointed king being despised and rejected by arrogant, sinful humanity... Every detail of the crucifixion is a precise fulfillment of what we read in the Psalms, Psalm 22 in particular. And may I say again that the silence of Jesus at this point, and humanly speaking, the impotence of Jesus at this point, adds to the strength, if you like, of what is going on. Jesus is silent. Jesus has allowed himself to be helpless in the hands of his oppressors. Events are, humanly speaking, outside of Jesus' control. And that those who are in charge of every aspect of Jesus' mockery and derision and public humiliation and execution fulfill to the letter precisely what God anticipated for his king in the hands of of the arrogant nations in the book of Psalms simply adds power, if you see what I mean, to what is going on. They murdered Jesus as God's king, just as God said they would. They reviled Jesus as God's king, just as God anticipated they would. 
Humanity despised and humiliated and rejected and made sport of Jesus as God's king, just as God prescribed that humanity would. The nations plotted against Jesus as God's king, just as in the Psalms we are told they would. The people of Israel blasphemed Jesus as God's king, just as the Psalms tell us the people of Israel would. Robbers reviled Jesus as God's king. The chief priests wagged their head at Jesus as God's king. They reviled him and humiliated him and despised him and spat at him and whipped him and made sport of him and dressed him up like a pantomime figure in royal robes and crashed down their staff on his head, crowned with thorns, and knelt and taunted him and offered him poisonous wine and divided his garments, and pierced his hands and his feet, just as God said they would a thousand years previously. One of our friends uh, here uh, at St. Helens, Roger Carswell, who's coming to speak next Monday, or whenever it is, Monday the the 22nd, the precise date you'll have to try and remember, which I can't, Um, He describes Jesus as the only man whose biography was written before he was born. And when you think about your own death and the control that you have over it, that is an extraordinary thing, isn't it? And here, when all else seems to be completely out of his control, even as he is undressed by those in charge and pinned mercilessly to the cross. Everything is precisely as God said it would be. So let's turn back, please, to Psalm 22. Now you'll find that on page 548, for Matthew quite clearly wants us to use this to make sense of what is going on. And kingship is the primary theme of this first part of his mocking, Hail, King of the Jews. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. What I've done on the outline, which you will find you've got a copy of on the notice sheet, on the back of the notice sheet, is to give you just a brief summary of the way Psalm 22 works. And the way Psalm 22 works is to chart three times the suffering of God's despised king. But each time his suffering is explained, there is then a second part where he speaks about his own trust in God and his ancestors' trust in God. So verses 1 and 2, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verses 3 to 5, our fathers trusted in you, God. Verses 5 to 8, all who see me mock me. Verses 9 to 11, be not far from me, an expression of trust. Verses 12 to 18, I'm poured out like water. Verses 19 to 21, be not far off, deliver my soul, save me. So in each pair, the king begins by describing his court torment and then he expresses his or his ancestors' trust in God. And the torment is fulfilled precisely at the cross. But where does the psalm end? From verse 22, we find God not only honoring, rescuing, but also vindicating and exalting his king who has suffered so greatly for his faithful obedience to God in pursuit of God's concerns. So what the psalm tells us is, yes, he is hated and mocked and despised for his faithful obedience to God. This is what the world does. This is what humanity does. God's king, in his world, representing God's rule, is despised by humanity because we love to be authors of our own destiny. We don't want God to have anything to do with us. And so we despise the rightful rule of God. But God's king, trusting in God, 
expresses his trust in faithful obedience and God then honors him. So look at verse 22 of Psalm 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard him when he cried to him. Look at verse 25. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. So verse 22 through to verse 26 are speaking, spoken particularly to the people of God. But verse 27 now it's like a, a, a pebble dropping in a pond. We now begin to radiate outwards and outwards and outwards. Look at verse 27. All the ends of the, the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. And now look at verse 29 and 30. We begin now to talk about those who have rejected the rule of this king. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow down who go down to the dust even the ones who could not keep himself alive posterity shall serve him it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it so we find this king who was despised and hated by and mocked derided and reviled by a world that hates the idea that there might be a creator God to whom they owe allegiance. Let's be done with him, and as we be, get rid of him, let's mock him and laugh at him. And we find that God vindicates, he honors, he enthrones, he exalts this king for his perfect obedience, such that all nations will bow before the one they mocked. And that brings us to the conclusion to which I think Matthew wants us to come because he so deliberately referenced Psalm 22. You know, because we love the idea of salvation, quite rightly, we regularly jump to Isaiah 53 in passages like that which speak of the salvation. Yeah, we will do that. We don't often go to Psalm 22, Psalm 69, and the big theme of kingship. And Matthew, in the early church, as our tutor in his seminary, is insisting that we go there by taking us to Psalm 22. Here is the conclusion. God will rescue and restore his holy king because God delights in him for his obedience. God's king will rule supreme not only over his nation but over all creatures. Every knee will bow to this king, both the living and the dead, through his perfectly obedient king whose legitimate and beautiful authority, gentle and perfect rule, humanity rejected and despised God will govern this universe through this king. And so Matthew is recording as first the soldiers, then the executioners, then Pilate, the kings and the rulers, and then the robbers, and then the passers-by, and finally the whole Jewish establishment and the whole world mock and revile King Jesus. Matthew is recording us this for us to show us a perfect fulfillment of Scripture, to give us an to show us this ugly exposure of humanity's sin, we will do anything to get rid of God's rule. To give us a clear warning, God will vindicate his king. And if we bow in worship to him now, as he commands us to, to encourage us. Where do we go with application? Well, in one sense, wonder, wonder, 
and or. I mean, Alec Matir has this wonderful day by day through the Psalms. Um, I love using it. And I, so I turned up to Alec Matir, and he just says this of Psalm 22 with the cross uh, as fulfillment. We marvel as well as tremble. We worship the Lord our God both for the extremity he suffered for us and for the book that he's written for our learning. You know, a thousand years before the death of Jesus, spelling out in precise detail exactly God's plan and purpose so that we wonder and marvel and praise and adore King Jesus for what he has done for us, for his perfect obedience, for his selfless sacrifice. So in one sense, what more to do than simply to wonder? May I give you just three other areas to consider through the week? The ugly exposure. There is something within the human heart that resists the rightful claim of God to rule over each and every one of his crea creatures. When God the Son entered into his creation to claim it for his own, he lived in perfect royal obedience. So threatening did humanity find the authority of God's perfect Son, so unacceptably challenging that we sought to dispose of him. And even as we did that, we decided to make sport of him by humiliating him. And so at the cross, God has shown us that humanity hates the claims of King Jesus so much as to be prepared to resist them at all costs and even to laugh at him as we do so. Do your friends sometimes say to you, if only Jesus would show himself today, then I would believe in him? Have you ever heard that? I can guarantee that I will hear that time and again in the next three weeks as we engage in all these dialogue events. And do you know what I've determined to say when tomorrow lunchtime, as I take a dialogue event in some bar just around the corner here with a group of people who very kindly agreed to come, 12 of them, to hear the good news of Jesus Christ explained. And when they say, which they will, if only Jesus would show himself today, then I would believe in him, I'm going to respond, well, actually, you wouldn't. You would crucify him. Because we hate there's something deep within us. We hate this claim to authority, especially in the generation that has enthroned me, the I generation, as we have placed ourselves on the throne. How we hate it that God might have the impudence to enter into his world and demand our submission. We hate it. Read your newspapers, go online, it's everywhere. The ugly exposure. And when I say, no, you wouldn't, you would crucify him, please, uh, I shall say, and, 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 and so would I, <laughs> apart from a work of Jesus Christ in my heart, so would I. Second sphere of application, the subversive challenge of the cross. For God has taken the total obedience of his son and honored it supremely, Humanity may have mocked him, God has enthroned him. We may have reviled him, God has exalted him. His people may have blasphemed him, God has crowned him. God has given to Jesus the name that is above every name because Jesus lived in perfect obedience. He showed us the life of total surrender as it was intended to be lived in this broken fallen, rebellious world in which we live. What a life. And he took his point, uh, obedience to the very point of death on a cross and did not flinch. And so God has given to King Jesus the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is a subversive challenge that this figure hanging on the cross, impotent, mocked, humiliated, spat at, God has taken 
and enthroned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I have on my bookshelf a whole series of books written by people who publicly and openly mock Jesus. The names are familiar to all of us. Dawkins, Hitchens, Ludwig Kennedy, A. N. Wilson, who has since changed his mind, Frederick Nietzsche, and on and on and on and on and on it goes. While you mock at King Jesus, God has enthroned him. You laugh at King Jesus, God has crowned him. You despise King Jesus, God has exalted him. And Psalm 22 tells us, and it's been fulfilled in precise detail a thousand years afterwards, by King Jesus, that whether you like it or not, or believe it or not, one day, before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Through gritted teeth, in great pain and sadness and deepest possible regret at your failure to recognize who King Jesus is, facing an eternity of anguish, you will kneel before him and, and acknowledge that this King Jesus is God's Lord. And finally, the implicit encouragement of the cross. Because we see here that the world despises that in which God delights. That the world hates that which God honors. And this sets the path for the whole of Christian experience. You must have heard of the picture of the donkey found in the Roman ruins. A piece of second century graffiti with a man on a cross with the head of a donkey and underneath written by some wag Alexamenos, which was a bloke's name, Alexamenos worships his God. People who've followed and worshipped Jesus have always been despised as he was on the cross. The world has always hated those who acknowledge that there's a higher authority than just me enthroned with my little crown on my head. The world's always hated that. It's a challenge to autonomy, isn't it? the world has always belittled and maligned and reviled those who follow King Jesus just as they did the king himself. They will malign you because you do not join with them in their debauchery. The world hates it because you're a challenge. They will deliver you over to the court and flog you in their synagogue You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness to them. Brother will deliver brother over to death. A father his child. You will be hated for my name's sake. They will laugh at you and mock you. But God has enthroned this king. So three application questions. People seem to like this. I think it can be quite helpful. Three application questions matching those three points. That first point... The ugly exposure. Am I still of the view that humanity is essentially decent? Look at the cross. I will find myself, in my view that humanity is essentially decent, to have been deluded. Am I still holding out in my rebellion against King Jesus? Look at the cross. I will eventually find myself thwarted. Am I currently maligned and despised? Look at the cross. I will ultimately find myself vindicated. Let's pray together. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. The families of the nations shall bow before you. Kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules the nations. We acknowledge our own 
rebellion and innate resistance to your loving rule, our Father in heaven. Please forgive us our sin. We are sorry for trying to hold out against you. We pray for those we know and love who currently resist your rule and mock and deride King Jesus or just feel sorry for him. We pray that you would have mercy upon them. And as we seek in however feeble a way, as we seek our Father to follow King Jesus, please grant us confidence and courage in the wisdom and power of the cross of King Jesus that you vindicate, that you honor, delight in obedience to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.